We come now to our Bible reading, which is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, and reading from verse 19 to the end. <clears throat> The Lord Jesus has been speaking and continues here at verse 19, saying, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. May God help us as we listen shortly to the preaching of his word as Tony comes to us, but before that we're going to sing once more. Uh, if you want to turn back in your Bibles to that passage that uh, Andy read, it's on page 1050. And let's pray before we hear that again. Lord, we've just sung that we might seek you when you may be found, and call upon you when you are near. Lord, help us to hear these difficult verses. Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray, through your living word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've entitled the sermon, Two Lifestyles, Two Eternities. And here in chapter 16 of Luke's Gospel, Jesus is teaching about two things, wealth and eternity. There are two parables in the chapter, one of the unjust steward uh, and this one of the rich man and Lazarus. Indeed, they both begin with exactly the same phrase. Verse 1, there was a rich man. Verse 19, there was a rich man. And to whom is Jesus telling these parables? Well, we're told in verse 14, to the Pharisees who loved money. And more than that, Luke tells us in that same verse that they heard all this, they were sneering at Jesus. Jesus is very challenging about the status and place of money in our lives and on the uncomfortable subject of hell. Jesus tells us that hell is a real place with real people and with no second chances. It's all very binary. 
joy or torment, present opportunity or permanent catastrophe. There isn't a third way. And so here is a sermon, I think, that has the potential either to completely ruin your day or, by God's grace, to change your destiny. I've divided this up into three sections in which we meet two people, two places, and two prayers. Two people, two places, and two prayers. So firstly, two people in verses 19 to 21. I read recently of a group of business study students at a top university who were asked, what do you hope to achieve after graduation from this university? The top three answers, perhaps predictable, wealth, fame, status. No mention of public service, no mention of their fellow humankind, just the best for me. And the best for me could easily have been the family motto of the first of our two people that we meet in verse 19. He's dressed in purple. Remember Lydia in Acts 16? A seller of purple goods, high quality. So think luxury cloth. Think cashmere. Think Christian door. Think designer clothes. It wasn't only what he wore, but also what he ate. The King James Version has it beautifully that he fared sumptuously every day. So think haute cuisine. Think caviar. Think Chateau Neuf de Pape. Think the Ritz. Notice too in verse 20 that this man's house has a gate. But the Greek word is not just any old gate. Oh no, this is a very ornamental gate. The one you might see at the entrance to Chatsworth House or some suitably large mansion. This was a gate. Think privacy. Think security. Think staff. And then in verse 20, there's such a stark contrast with our second of our two people, a beggar named Lazarus, who was laid at the rich man's gate. And the latter detail suggests that he's a paralytic, he's unable to walk himself, and that he's brought here each day, doubtless hoping that some of his needs might mercifully be met by the rich man. So the contrasts of these two are absolutely stark. One is covered in the finest linen, the other is covered in sores. One eats sumptuously every day, the other longs to eat just the scraps from the rich man's table. One is doubtless attended by staff, the other is attended by dogs who come to lick his sores in verse 21. For one is as good as it gets, and for the other it's pretty much as bad as it gets. One is an insider, the other a complete outsider. One has everything, the other seemingly has nothing. The sheer inequalities of these two lives are incomprehensible and staggering. But as we meet these two people, we need to be careful not to read the wrong lessons into Jesus' parable. So let me begin by suggesting how we should not hear this parable. This isn't Jesus having a go at rich people. After all, we're going to meet Abraham later in the parable. And as early as Genesis 13, uh, we're told that he had become very wealthy in livestock, silver and gold. No, it's the self-indulgence. It's the selfishness. It's the godlessness. And nor is Jesus seeking to glorify poverty. It's not a quasi-Marxist critique of inequalities in our society. 
You see, the trouble with the rich man was that he'd invented his own version of the prosperity gospel before anyone thought of inventing it. Because to him, wealth meant God's blessing. Poverty meant God's displeasure, God's cursing. But all it really shows is how little he knew of his Bible. Had he, for example, never read God speaking his words through the prophet Jeremiah? These words in chapter 9, Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. The 19th century Anglican bishop J.C. Ryle comments on these verses, Wealth is no mark of God's favour, and poverty is no mark of God's displeasure. If we would measure men as God measures them, we must, value, we must value them only according to the grace they have received. And so in that sense, the two people who were meeting might better be described as a poor rich man and a rich poor man. Secondly, the two places, verses 22 and 23, of equally stark contrast. Heaven and hell. We learn of the universality of death. First in verse 22, we're told that the beggar dies. No surprise there, one might think. There was probably no funeral, and it's quite likely that his body would merely have been taken to the city dump. And then the rich man dies, discovering, of course, that wealth can't buy you extra days. Doubtless there would have been a lavish funeral with wonderful eulogies, effusive of his greatness and goodness. But we also find that death has effected a great reversal in terms of the two places in which our two people now find themselves. Lazarus, we read in verse 22, is carried by angels to Abraham's side. Abraham, mark you, Abraham, the friend of God. And Paul describes as the father of all who believe. And so instantly we know that Lazarus must, in this life, have been a true believer. It wasn't his earthly poverty that saved him, as if earthly suffering merited some kind of eternal reward. No, Lazarus, whose very name means he whom God helps, was saved, like you and me, by grace and through faith. The soul of Lazarus had arrived in heaven exactly the same way as the soul of Abraham had arrived, by faith. So although how or when Lazarus came to believe is not explicitly stated in the parable, we know that Lazarus, upon death, immediately received the blessed joy and intimate fellowship which we have with God's people in glory. And so if you're a true Christian believer this morning, then we should be looking forward to that blessed joy of being in the very presence of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the joyful expectation of every true believer to what the Apostle Peter describes as that inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. And then says Jesus, there's a second of our two places, hell. And whereas Lazarus, after death, found himself, I think, exactly where he was expecting to be, the rich man was doubtless shocked, appalled, to find himself in hell. The trouble was, this man never really believed what he professed to believe. He wouldn't have called himself an atheist. Like the Pharisees to whom Jesus is telling the parable, he would probably have claimed that scripture was the word of God, that there was a final judgment after death. It's just that he never took it seriously. He probably believed in hell. 
just that it never occurred to him that people like him would end up in it. As one commentator puts it, the very idea that God would send him or any of his cultured, polished, sophisticated, nice friends to hell, to him was preposterous. What a warning. Because if we're in the same mind, the shock will be ours. There's just one specific thing we learn about the rich man in hell in verse 23 again, that he was in torment. Though the Greek is in the plural, in torments. So let's be clear, this is not some kind of limbo. This is not purgatory. This is not a waiting room. This is real. And this is awful. And yet, how often do one hear, does one hear people tell jokes about hell? Oh, I won't mind hell because all my friends will be there. I recently heard President Trump tell a joke at a political rally about a former political rival who had recently died who he believed was in hell. Well, Mr. Trump and others would do well to learn from Scripture that hell is no joke. As the writer to the Hebrews warns us, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, two people, two places, two prayers in verses 24 to 31. And I'm going to suggest that from these two prayers we can learn three lessons. Now, I think as we move into these later verses, it's important to say that Jesus is not unpacking a detailed geography of heaven and hell. It's a story, it's a parable. The conversations are imaginary, and we shouldn't read them with strict literalism. So, for example, we know people in hell can't actually see and converse with those in heaven. But equally, Jesus is not in any way seeking to mislead about human destiny. He wants us to know that both heaven and hell exist, that both are awesome realities. And so there are important truths here. We can see two of them through the two prayers, if that's what we can call them, of the rich man. And it's in these verses where I think you can get the definite impression that the rich man is utterly stunned by his afterlife predicament. So what does he decide to do? He plays the religious card. Verse 24. Father Abraham. Even the terminology is a bit of a giveaway. After all, how can a son of Abraham be in hell? Well, he should have listened to the preaching of John the Baptist. We find these words earlier in John's Gospel. As John is preaching to the crowds in chapter 3. You brood of vipers, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say we have Abraham for our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise children for Abraham. Well, let's pick our passage up again at verse 22. Where we read that the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torments, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. Well, what an irony. The rich man looks up and sees... Lazarus, something it would have appear he could have done any day of his earthly life. But he chose not to. It even transpires that he knows the man's name. So for all those days, all those months, all those years of ignoring, he actually did know who he was all the time. There's also surely an irony in what the rich man now asks for, relief, pity. 
is exactly what he long so long denied Lazarus in his earthly life. And so in verses 25 and 26, Abraham denies the rich man's request. And in hearing the reasons for the denial, we have the teaching that Jesus wanted the Pharisees then and us today to learn and to hear and to act upon. So first in verse 25, we see God's justice. You see, the point is not that the rich go to hell and the poor go to heaven. As we've already said, there's no merit in poverty, there's no demerit in wealth. Now, how often does Jesus teach that the love of wealth can so easily be a stumbling block to hearing and responding to the gospel? But no, the point is that this man had failed to follow Jesus' early teaching in verse 9, to make friends for himself in eternity. He'd already received all the good things he had enjoyed in his earthly lifetime. He had nothing more coming to him, not even a drop of water. What Jesus wants us to see is that if we live only for the things of this world, then we will have no heavenly inheritance. We fail to want it in this life, and we won't inherit it after death. What does Abraham say to the rich man? Verse 25 again, remember. One commentator of a few centuries ago writes, remembrance will enhance the bitterness of hell when sinners call to mind the privileges they enjoyed, the mercies they slighted, the warnings they rejected, the time and talents they wasted. But there is a second lesson for this request being denied, and it comes in verse 26. Stated simply but starkly, hell is irreversible. There's a bridgeless chasm cutting us off, says Abraham, and there's no traffic between the two in either direction. Hell has no exit door, no second chances, no opportunity for buyer's regret. By then, the time of God's grace will forever have passed. Our eternal future will be sealed. There can be no more grim warning that a preacher must convey. But the rich man doesn't give up. He has a second prayer. This is 27 and 28. Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not come to this place of torment. Ah, is it possible that after all, the rich man is having a change of heart? After all this, unlike the first prayer, it does appear not to be a selfish request. Is he now somehow showing concern for others? Well, I think if we're thinking those thoughts, it's probably wishful thinking. The giveaway really is that hell hasn't changed him at all. He still sees Lazarus in exactly the same way as he always saw him. Did you notice verse 24? Send Lazarus. Verse 27, send Lazarus. He still sees Lazarus as a kind of spiritual gopher, someone to do his legwork for him. Hell hasn't changed him. There's no remorse. There's no humility. There's no brokenness. And there's no repentance. Just a kind of horrible, angry arrogance and a sense of self-entitlement. He even seems to think that he still has some residual standing with God. You see, he doesn't get God's assessment of Lazarus because people like him don't get God's assessment of anything. And the man to whom he showed no mercy is now meant to be the deliverer of mercy to him and his family. But it's too late. And again, the request is denied and again, there's a reason given in verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them, says Abraham. Well, so far, Abraham's reasons have been first, the justice of God, second, the irreversibility of hell, but now we have a third reason, the sufficiency of scripture. 
You see, what Abraham is telling him is that even the Old Testament, says Moses, says Abraham, is sufficient. So how much more without excuse will we be who have the added witness of Jesus himself and of the New Testament and the inspired writers? I'm not a great Twitter fan, but I came across this on Twitter a few years ago from Joey Barton, the former Everton, Liverpool, Manchester United, Newcastle United, Queen's Park Rangers, Marseille, Glasgow Rangers and Burnley footballer. <laughs> and now manager of, amongst other things, Bristol Rovers, obviously a very loyal and dedicated and single-minded young man. But sadly he tweeted, I don't believe in God. I might be proved wrong about this, but as of yet, no evidence exists. No evidence? No evidence? Nothing has changed, has it? Not enough evidence. This man's five brothers would say, didn't have enough evidence, so we need some more help. But God says, you've got all the evidence you need. Alexander McLaren, in his commentary on these verses, says this, the real ground of our sinful lives is not deficiency of light or deficiency of warning, but our own inward aversion to the truth. What is lacking in us is not more light, but eyes to see it and a heart to love it. Indeed, the very scene of the telling of this parable is proof enough here were these Pharisees sitting at the very seat of the Son of God, the light of the world. And their response, they sneered. What a challenge. Am I like that? Are you like that? Still living proof of the truth that Jesus had told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. This is the verdict, says Jesus, that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You see, we don't respond to the commands of the gospel based solely on what we know, but on what we love. This world, or the gospel of our Lord. But back in our passage, the rich man is still not done. He's nothing if not persistent. And in verse 30, he starts advising Abraham. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. How many times have we heard similar protestations? Now, if God did something really big in my life, I believe. And the story just ends with Abraham's final words to the rich man in verse 31. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. And of course, Jesus' own resurrection just a few weeks later would prove that point abundantly. So we've met two people in two places and heard two prayers. And Jesus wants to challenge you and, and me this morning. First about wealth and money. And so I believe he asks us through this parable, what am I investing my life in? Whose cause are you most passionate about? Could someone tell from the expenditure column of our bank accounts that we're Christian believers? Where's our heart? On God or on things? Am I loving God and using money? Or am I using God and loving money? Second, Jesus wants to challenge us about the finality and irreversibility of eternity that hell has no exit door, no second chances. I once heard a minister put it quite starkly at a funeral when he warned the congregation, don't get into the coffin without knowing the only way out of it. Can you say with Job of old, I know that my Redeemer lives? 
and that he shall stand in the last day upon the earth, and though after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Don't be wrong about death. Don't be wrong about eternity. Don't be trusting in the wrong things to see your soul safely into heaven. Some years ago, the doyen of TV interviewer, Sir David Frost, was interviewing the American evangelist, Billy Graham. And Frost had a long res time respect for Graham. He'd actually attended one of his crusade meetings in Haringey. At one point in the interview, while discussing heaven, David Frost suggested, he said this, he said, when I die, I'm going to knock at the gates of heaven and say, Billy Graham said I can come in. Billy Graham shot back, that won't do you any good. You've got to be able to say, Christ said I can come in. Will I be able to say that? Will you be able to say that? And so to close, I think whenever we study one of Jesus' parables, the preacher often asks towards the end, so who in the parable do you identify with? Now, although there is a clear warning not to suffer the fate of the rich man, because we're all still alive, we can't truly identify with either of the two main characters. And so I think it's worth pointing out that if we missed it, that we're meant to be identifying with the five brothers in verse 28. We've got a passing mention, but that's us, because we're the ones who are still alive. And so Jesus' final challenge to us concerns the sufficiency of Scripture. So what's your reaction, what's my reaction to the reading and preaching of the Word of God? Because it's only Scripture in which we can find the gospel of grace. And we seal our eternity by our response to the God of the Bible and of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I think, says to us with unmistakable clarity in these verses, if you won't be changed by the truths of Scripture, then you won't be changed by anything. The only way to heaven is through faith in the one atoning sacrifice of Christ. So let me finally ask, can each one of us sing truly from our hearts the words of our final hymn, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but holy trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, these are hard words to hear. These are challenging verses. Lord, may none of us leave as we came in. May we each, Lord, be truly spoken to you through your Holy Word and through your Holy Spirit. And may we be able to join each of us with our hearts and lips in the verse of this last hymn as we sing our praises to you for the Christ who has died and the faith that you have given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen.